James Henchman, often known as Jimmy Henchman, was an American entertainment record executive and convicted drug trafficker. Henchman was born in February of 1965 in Harlem, New York. He grew up in Flatbush, Brooklyn, in an apartment complex called Vanderveer Gardens. His parents migrated from Haiti in the 1960s. They divorced when he was young, leaving his mother to raise five children alone. He would get involved in the music business though, when Henchman and several friends founded the music conference, How Can I Be Down in 1992. Dexter was another man from Brooklyn. He too, grew up in Vanderveer Gardens, and who meet Jimmy at age 13. Rapper Biggie Smalls used to sell drugs for him while he was a youngster. Sometime in or before 1994, Henchman would have a fallout with the rapper, Tupac. Allegedly, Tupac owed Henchman some money for something. Henchman knew that Tupac was broke, but still demanded that the rap legend pay him with cash and not a check. That would spark what would be known as, the infamous Quad Studio shooting. On November 30, 1994, Pac was robbed and shot at the Quad Record Studios in Manhattan. It's alleged that Henchman paid Dexter $2,500 and was allowed to keep all the jewelry, except for one diamond ring. Henchman planned to put the diamond in a new setting for his girlfriend at the time, Cynthia Reed. Stretch, who was Tupac's close friend and member of the live squad, was giving Henchman the play-by-play -play to set up Pac. While in New York recording verses for a mixtape of Ron G, Tupac was repeatedly distracted by his beeper. Music manager, Jimmy Henchman, reportedly offered him $7,000 to stop by Quad Studios that night. He wanted him to record a verse for his client, Little Sean. He was unsure, but agreed to the session as he needed the cash to offset legal costs. Pac was involved in a rape case, and the verdict would be announced the following day. Anyway, he arrived with Stretch and one or two others to the studio. In the lobby, they were approached by three gunmen who demanded their money and jewelry. Stretch and the other, or others, obeyed the commands, but Pac began cursing at the gunman, resulting in him being shot five times and robbed of 40k worth of jewelry. He was then dragged into the elevator to safety. Against doctor's advice, Tupac checked out of Metropolitan Hospital Center a few hours after surgery. He secretly went to the house of the actress Jasmine Guy, who had met during his guest appearance on the sitcom, A Different World, in 1993. He would recuperate there. The next day, Pac arrived at a Manhattan courthouse bandaged in a wheelchair to receive the jury's verdict for his sexual abuse case. Tupac posted a $25,000 bond and spent the next few weeks being cared for by his mother and a private doctor at Guy's home. The Fruit of Islam and former members of the Black Panther Party stood guard to protect him. Allegedly, Tupac shot himself in the groin with his own gun in attempt to draw first, and that the gunman never shot him five times. Either way, Tupac isn't here to speak about it. In a 1995 interview with Vibe magazine, Pac accused Puffy Combs, Jimmy Henchman, and Biggie, among others, of setting up or being privy to the November 1994 robbery and shooting. The connections are murky here, because Henchman did have business with artists like Black Rob, Mario Winans and Craig Mack, so there's a lot happening there. Just a note, he also worked with the likes of Foxy Brown at one point, and Wycliffe John early on. The accusations were significant to the East-West Coast rivalry in hip-hop, the accusation was because Puffy and Biggie were at Quad Studios at the time, and in 1995, months later, Puffy and Biggie releasing the song, Who Shot Ya? Whereas the song made no direct reference or naming of Tupac, Tupac mistakenly took it as a mockery of his shooting, and thought they could be responsible, so he released a direct diss song called Hit Em Up, where he targeted Puffy, their record label Junior Mafia, and at the end of Hit Em Up, he mentions rivals Mob Deep and Chino XL. Pac didn't know Stretch was in on the hit, and was upset with him, for not doing anything to prevent the attack despite being unarmed. He didn't do what your dog is supposed to do when you're shot up, Tupac said of his close friend. Later, Stretch would do collaborations with a notorious B.I.G., which only enraged Pac more. Stretch would be killed in a shooting exactly one year after the shooting at Quad Studios. Many believe that it was in retaliation for Pac. In the song, Holla At Me, off of the All Eyes On Me album, Tupac rapped about Stretch. He also mentions Jimmy Henchman on the Seven Day Theory album. He raps, I heard he was light-skinned, stocky with a Haitian accent, jewelry, fast cars, and he's known for flashing, listen while I take you back and lace this rap, a real live tale about a snitch named Haitian Jack. Knew he was working for the feds, same crime different trail. 
promise to pay back Jimmy Henchman in due time and know you bit ninjas listening, the world is mine. Set me up, wet me up, heard the guns bust, but you tricks never shut me up. Allegedly, Stretch was to be paid a quarter brick of coke for his role in the setup. Indeed, Henchman was heavily involved in the drug game, and we will provide detail on how he ran the enterprise later in the video. As for Dexter, the man paid by Henchman for the robbery would go on to serve life in prison for murder, robbery and other offenses. We might do a little story on him one day. Anyway, Henchman would not face any legal consequences, as it was only hearsay at the time. Around 1996, Henchman founded Henchman, the company that would later become the rap management company Czar. He was the CEO of Czar when it managed the game, Sean Kingston, Randy, Gucci Mane, Gorilla Black, Salt and Pepper and Akon. He had become a well-known figure in the hip-hop music industry, described in a 2012 The New York Times article as, a prince at the royal court, whose ties to rap music's biggest stars were known far and wide. Henchman was behind Salt and Pepper's, shoot, and in 2002, Henchman negotiated the Lennox Lewis vs. Mike Tyson boxing match. It was the first time that a boxer demanded that after a million buys on pay-per-view, the boxers would split the purse 50-50 with Showtime Network's HBO. In 2003, Henchman, along with Chris Lighty, joined Russell Simmons in his campaign to end New York's draconian Rockefeller drug laws. In the midst of what sounds like success, hovers a dark cloud. Things get crazy. During the mid-2000s, 05, 06, henchmen had tensions with different music groups, such as Death Row Records, G-Unit, and Chris Lighty's affiliation, Violator Records. Things particularly got heated with rapper 50 Cent, as henchman was the game's manager during their feud, and Chris Lighty, who was representing 50 Cent. In early 2005, the game put out his debut solo album, The Documentary. During that time, it's alleged that 50 Cent felt some sort of disloyalty from Game during his own feuds with other popular street rappers. 50 Cent publicly exiled him from G-Unit during a live radio show on Hot 97. The Game went to the station with a big entourage to confront 50 Cent. An argument ensured, followed by four gunshots. One man from Game's entourage named Reed was hit in the thigh and recovered at the hospital. Tef, who has a long history as a petty drug dealer and one of the top enforcers for Czar, described shooting up the entrance of Mr. Lighty's company, Violator Records in 2005. It happened just hours after the gunfight outside of Hot 97. Shots were fired, but they were only intended to send a message. No one was hit. The dispute that began as the usual posturing between hip-hop personas, calculated to excite fans and sell albums as both 50 Cent and The Game, released insulting raps about each other, became for Henchman, a personal vendetta toward anyone connected with G-Unit. In one situation, Tef was arrested while staking out to shoot the doors up. He was arrested and cops found his car, another dude named Andre and a gun inside. The case was dismissed though, mainly due to the police conduct. Tensions between Henchman and G-Unit began to heat up in December 2006 during the mixtape awards at the Apollo Theater. That night, Tony Yeo was talking real aggressive to Henchman and started yelling at him about the game's insults. Henchman was moving really passive, and Tef stepped in and started violating, talking crazy and sticking up for Henchman. Members of G-Unit seemingly Megan to mobilize, blocking the entrances and exits. Allegedly, Tef and Jimmy was about to get shot by G-Unit member, Maserati Fox, who is now deceased. Allegedly, he flashed a gun, but Tef, Henchman, and other members of Czar were able to leave out the back exit before anything went down. Later that night, Tony Yeo's Bentley was riddled with several bullets as it idled on Madison Avenue in Harlem. A few days later, Puffy attempted to squash things between both parties, Henchman representing Czar and Chris Lighty representing G-Unit. There, at Puffy's office, the two managers started scuffling, and Puffy had to break up the fight. Def said he spent many nights with henchmen staking out 50 Cent, Tony Yeo or Mr. Lighty, looking for a chance to shoot them. It escalated in March 2007, when Tony Yeo and a member of the G-Unit entourage, Lowell Fletcher, aka Lodi Mac, assaulted henchmen's 14-year-old son on West 25th Street. Allegedly he was smacked, or pushed down publicly, and a gun was pulled out, or flashed. Lodi Mac, was a Bloods gang member, and ended up in prison for the assault plus drug possession. Tony Yeo got 10 days community service. It's alleged that 50 Cent was also present, but turned a blind eye, and entered a truck nearby. 
As the feud escalated, henchmen had guys take part in several tit-for-tat acts of violence. In some cases, members would encourage the violence independently out of loyalty. For example, after henchman's son was assaulted, he and Tef spotted Chris Lighty's brother. Henchman was hesitant to have anything happen to Lighty's brother, as he had nothing to do with the immediate beef with G-Unit. Still, Tef encouraged the beef, as he felt all gloves were off at that point. Half-heartedly, he gave Tef the nod. Tef himself would run down on Lighty's brother with a razor in the street. He hit him in the head, breaking the razor and fled after a quick stare down with someone accompanying Lighty that pulled a knife. Another time, Khalil, another's our entertainment member, shot up Tony Yeo's brother's van as they waited for Tony Yeo to enter. At this time, Yeo and his people had the drop on Tef and wanted to eradicate him. Henchmen pursued revenge against G-Unit for the next two years, shooting up the homes and torching the cars of his enemies. Sometime during the beef, Tef, Jason, who was driving, and henchmen were in henchmen's Lexus. They spotted Lighty, but when they were able to access him by his place in Manhattan, he was gone. Tef had a loaded 22 caliber silencer belonging to henchmen. Tef was also a part of the hunt for Tony Yeo. After getting info that Tony Yeo was occasionally out in Staten Island, he hired a guy named Life to go out there and shoot the house up. The house belonged to G-Unit Road Manager, Monster. You may have heard about Monster as 50's muscle and is rarely seen, but is close by. In turn, Tef was paid 10 to 12 bands by henchmen and Life got 2-3 bands from Tef. Afterward, they got information on Monster's sister who was living in Brooklyn. Tef again sent Life to shoot up that house. Life would lie and say he committed this shooting, but ultimately did nothing. Tef ended up paying Life and confronted him about the lie later. Life fled, and Tef didn't get paid from henchmen for this attempted act. Henchmen already knew Life didn't do anything, as nobody heard shots. Around the same time period, a second attempt at Monster's house took place. Tef, along with henchmen this time, traveled to Stapleton in a car. Henchman took a gun out of the stash box and gave it to Tef, a smoke gray 45 caliber silencer. After leaving the car and hoping a fence, he spotted Monster in a window that appeared to be a kid's room. He also saw a little girl and had second thoughts about the shooting. He went back to the car where Henchman expressed his anger with Tef. He never told him why he decided not to shoot. Sometime around this time, Tef's Escalade was shot up. According to Tef, Monster was responsible. Months later, in retaliation, Tef and Andre, who he got arrested with some time ago for attempting to shoot up Violator Records, went back to Monster's house. This time, they sat outside almost till sunrise waiting for Monster to show. He never did, so in attempt to draw him out, they crafted some Molotov cocktails. In a failed attempt to smoke Monster out and then shoot him, Tef became frustrated and just began shooting the house up as well as the bulletproof car. Tef was hoping to damage the car with a Molotov so that Monster could be vulnerable. Monster never came out and eventually, Tef and Andre left. Allegedly, Monster had 10 bands on Tef's head and henchmen found out. Upon learning this info, they tried to negotiate with a mutual who knew about the hit, offering 25 bands to line Monster instead. Although the mutuals didn't care for Monster too much, they chose not to get involved. When Tef offered 75k, word was, for 75k, Monster will get his head blown off. Henchmen had previously only agreed to spending 25k and laughed at the thought of even spending more than that on Monster. Tef was frustrated, feeling like he was expendable. He thought him and henchmen could split the 75k for Monster as henchman's son was slapped and Tef's truck had been shot up. The transaction never took place and the contract was never filled. At this time, Tef had no access to any loaded firearms and was playing defense. As a result of the beef, on one occasion, another's R associate was paid $5,000 for having a G-Unit Jeep torched in New Jersey. Finally, on September 27, 2009, henchmen orchestrated the shooting of Lodi Mac on Jerome Avenue in the Bronx. He had been released from prison two weeks prior for the assault on henchman's son, along with drug charges. Let's go back a little bit to see how this comes about. Slim was a low-level drug dealer from Baltimore. He had did some college and some army when he moved to New York. He had been regularly selling crack between 89 and 93. He and another dude he met named Derek Grant, who was also from Baltimore, started selling crack together. 
In 97, he would catch a drug charge and be sent to the Tombs, another name for Manhattan's detention center. Here, he would met Henchman, who was in jail at the time. The two would take liking to each other and developed a friendship. Slim had heard his name before, but had never met him until then. While locked up, Derek Grant, who Slim knew from selling crack on the street, would also end up in the tombs. Grant would also join the fold, developing a similar relationship with Henchman. They continued the relationship upon release. Slim would do errands at Henchman's studio in the early 2000s. He would return to prison in 2004 after the police caught him as he carried 9 kilograms of cocaine out of a stash house for Henchman. While incarcerated, he said, he befriended a Bloods gang member named Biggs, who was close to Lodi Mac. Biggs and Lodi Mac had the same lawyer. Slim had seen Lodi Mac, who was locked up at Mohawk Correctional Facility, and heard him bragging about Lodi Mac. He acted like he didn't know though. Allegedly, Lodi Mac was involved in a robbery committed against the friend of the Bloods member that Slim befriended. The Blood member didn't care much for Lodi Mac, and would basically be willing to give info on him. Slim would be released from Fishkill Correctional Facility in August 2009. The following day, he met with henchmen outside Central Park and told him he had a line on the individual who slapped his son. A few days later, the pair met at the food court in the Whole Foods of Columbus Circle, where henchmen offered him $30,000 to lead Lodi Mac into an ambush. At first, it was alleged that henchmen wanted to shoot Lodi Mac himself, saying it's going to be so fast and so quick no one will know. But Slim persuaded him to hire a mutual friend, Derek Grant, to pull the trigger. It had been three years since henchmen seen D, but agreed to the idea. Derek had also participated in the Violator record shooting years prior. Slim would go meet Derek to put him on. Derek was with it, but felt like they would need at least 60k for the hit. After all deliberations, the hit was to be carried out. During this time, they were getting the drop from Biggs on Lodi Mac. He was about to be released from Mohawk and was moving downstate to Queensboro. He would be touching down in the weeks ahead. When the time came, Slim and Jason initially tried to catch him at the jail upon his release, but he had been picked up moments before by his peoples. The situation was sketchy anyway due to cameras. Slim decided to call the lawyer which represented both Biggs and Lodi Mac. Indeed he was able to get through and speak with Mac. Lodi, unbeknownst to him, was being presented with a false sense of security be Slim. Slim told him that Biggs had to look out for him on the outside and that they should soon meet up after Lodi got situated with a cell phone or whatnot. Lodi Mac agreed. Slim did not reveal his real identity but told Lodi that he was affiliated with the Bloods and not a Bloods member when Lodi asked. In the coming days, Lodi would indeed contact Slim. The plan was going as it should. Another meeting would take place down the line between Henchman and Slim before the actually murder. Jason was present this time. Henchman reconfirms Slim's willingness to commit the murder, and Slim purchases a cell phone exclusively for the setup. On September 25th, Slim scouted a location, which was a no-go due to cameras. The next day, Slim, Jason, and Derek Grant went out looking for a better location for the shooting. They settled on a dark, quiet area near the 4 train station on Mount Eden Avenue in the Bronx. Slim arranged to meet Lodi Mac there the following evening. And confirmed with Henchman via text. Henchman had also sent two others R associates Rodney and Sean to serve as backup. Slim and Lodi Mac then exchanged a series of phone calls, as Slim sought to lure Lodi Mac to the spot where Grant was waiting for him. Slim told Grant the gunman to take his position. When the time came, Grant shot Lodi Mac five times in the back, using a silencer and gun provided to him by henchmen. Lodi Mac died shortly thereafter. In return, henchmen paid Slim and Grant with a kilogram of cocaine, worth approximately $30,000. So, how was henchmen getting money outside the music business? What is going on as far as the kilos which we have heard of so far? So let us detail that part for you. As we stated, henchman was involved heavily in the drug business and was what you would call a kingpin. The henchman organization's core mission was the shipment of kilogram quantities of cocaine from California to New York and the return of millions in drug proceeds from New York back to California. Because the cooperating witnesses are unnamed in the drug conspiracy, we will give them names. According to two high-ranking members of the henchman organization, Money and Randall, henchmen headed a drug trafficking organization which relied on numerous cohorts on both coasts to ensure a near-continuous flow of cocaine and cash. 
Specifically, henchmen regularly directed money to take possession of narcotics proceeds in New York and transport those proceeds to the West Coast. In addition, henchmen regularly directed Randall to take possession and distribute the narcotics that arrived in New York. The organization's methods of shipment changed over time in response to law enforcement actions against the organization. Prior to 2010, the henchman organization used overnight mail carriers such as Federal Express and UPS to transport narcotics and narcotics proceed. Prior to 2010, the henchman organization used overnight mail carriers such as Federal Express and UPS to transport narcotics and narcotics proceeds. Money and Randall told agents that cocaine and cash was packaged in vacuum sealed wrapping and covered with mustard to mask the smell of narcotics from drug detecting dogs. The packages then were mailed under fictitious names and received by catchers who were paid to take temporary possession of the parcels. Henchmen instituted this method of transporting contraband to insulate the core members of the henchman organization from prosecution. It lowered the risk of seizure by law enforcement and ensured that the core members of the organization would not be caught receiving the packages. For example, in 2009, a cousin of henchmen's, who Money and Randall have identified as a member of the henchman organization, was arrested after attempting to take possession of a parcel containing over 5 kilograms of cocaine packaged in mustard. That individual has since pled guilty to participating in a drug trafficking conspiracy and received a sentence of 10 years as imprisonment. In addition, in December 2009, one of the Los Angeles-based members of the organization was arrested after he tooled possession of three packages in Los Angeles that contained approximately $452,000 in cash that was packaged in vacuum-sealed wrapping and covered in mustard. Further, in the summer of 2010, a search warrant was executed on a storage locker in the Los Angeles area that belonged to one of Henchman's brothers. This locker's contents consisted of a suitcase containing mustard vacuum sealing and other drug packing materials. Agents also had made numerous consensual recordings which captured Henchman's brother, arranging for the shipment of cocaine packages. He was subsequently arrested and has pled guilty to participating in a narcotics trafficking conspiracy. In the summer of 2010, agents in Los Angeles arrested one of the cocaine suppliers to the henchman organization, Quincy, after Quincy was observed attempting to mail parcels containing kilograms of cocaine, packaged in vacuum sealing and covered in mustard. Quincy has pled guilty to participating in a narcotics trafficking conspiracy and agreed to cooperate with the government. Among other things, Quincy stated that over a period of nearly two years, he provided over 100 kilograms of cocaine to the Rosemond organization, some of which henchmen personally ordered. Approximately two weeks after Quincy's arrest, henchmen telephoned a longtime friend and associate of the henchman organization, Tuffer. Unbeknownst to henchmen, Tuffer had been arrested and pled guilty pursuant to a cooperation agreement for his participation in the henchman organization's cocaine conspiracy. During the call, henchmen warned Tuffer of the implications of Quincy's arrest. Agents recorded this conversation and captured henchmen warning Tuffer that Tuffer's phone was likely tapped, that Tuffer's arrest was imminent, and that Tuffer should go into hiding. Henchman says. Your phone has an extra effing tap in your house, you understand what I'm telling you my ninja. Like for real, for real, like move like you're on the run, move like you know these people are coming bro. Ninja, it could be a false alarm, but I'm telling you right now my ninja, move like you're on the run. During this conversation, Henchman, believing that the government had obtained incriminating evidence against him, stated that he no longer communicated using cellular telephones, and that he was in the process of obtaining false identification in contemplation of going into hiding. According to Money and Randall, following the arrest of Quincy and the other aforementioned seizures and arrests, henchmen altered the way the henchman organization transported cocaine and cash. Instead of using overnight delivery services, henchmen directed that his organization hide contraband in road cases used to transport music equipment. In light of Henchman's position as the CEO of Czar Entertainment, a music and talent management company, Henchman was able to disguise these shipments as legitimate freight that was ostensibly needed by the performance artists he managed. The road cases method of trafficking worked as follows. After the road cases containing cocaine arrived in music studios in New York City, members of the Henchman organization retrieved the road cases and distributed the cocaine. Henchman's underlings collected the proceeds from cocaine sales, packed the cash into the road cases, and transported them to music studios in Los Angeles. 
There, the money was used to purchase more cocaine. The road cases were often shipped under the alias Peter Davis. Money and Randall played integral parts in the road cases scheme by retrieving the cocaine once it arrived at the New York studios, distributing the cocaine to area dealers, and ensuring that the money needed to purchase additional narcotics was shipped to Los Angeles. According to Randall, during 2010 and 2011, Truth personally participated in and oversaw the shipment of hundreds of kilograms of cocaine, using this method of shipment. Moreover, according to Money, during 2010 and 2011, Money participated in and oversaw the shipment of millions of dollars in narcotics proceeds, using this method of shipment. Henchmen arranged and coordinated these orders and shipments. Shipping records obtained by the government revealed that the contraband-filled road cases were shipped under accounts belonging to Tsar and to an individual who worked as the road manager for one of the performing artists henchmen managed. The government seized one such road case. In the winter of 2010, acting on information provided by money, DEA agents recovered approximately a 790,000 of the henchmen organization's drug proceeds, hidden inside a music case at a New York City recording studio that had been rented under the name, Peter Davis. The currency was packaged in vacuum-sealed plastic in $100,000 bundles, which included $30,463 and $20 bills. Agents later learned that the road manager had arranged for the case to be transported from the studio in which it was discovered to Los Angeles. In addition, in November, Z Dog, another of Henchman's brothers, was found in possession of an automobile that contained a false compartment inside of which members of the California Highway Patrol discovered approximately $800,000 cash. In 2011, Henchman again altered his organization's methods. According to Randall, henchmen ordered that cocaine be transported in eight traps or hidden compartments of automobiles that were to be shipped from Los Angeles to New York. In addition, henchmen became even more careful about evading law enforcement surveillance when speaking with other members of his organization. When DEA agents arrested Quincy on May 4, 2011, Key was in possession of a BlackBerry device that Key used to directly communicate with henchmen through a sophisticated email encryption system. According to Randall, henchmen would only give orders relating to narcotics trafficking via dot this encrypted email system. Additionally, Rosman provided key members of his organization with new BlackBerry devices on an almost monthly basis. After Randall's arrest, Key agreed to let agents monitor henchmen's encrypted emails to Randall in real time over a period of approximately one week. These communications revealed that henchmen had arranged a transaction whereby an automobile containing a hidden compartment was going to be transported to a narcotics buplier who was to fill the hidden compartment with cocaine. Further, the email suggested that the vehicle henchman was to use to collect the drugs was not working. For example, henchmen stated in one email. This car thing is messing me up, I have a guy here ready to pass me 10, and I'm can't move. It's such a short run from here too. Henchman was complaining that he could not arrange for the pickup of 10 kilograms of cocaine because the automobile that was to be used to hide the cocaine was not operating correctly. Subsequent emails revealed Henchman's request for assistance in procuring a different vehicle. There were other coded emails as well. In one coded email, Henchman was telling Randall that Randall should be prepared to pick up one kilogram of cocaine and was naming the price for it, $30,500. Through the consensually monitored emails, Henchman and Randall agreed to meet on May 11, 2011 in Brooklyn, New York, for purposes of Randall receiving the kilogram of cocaine from Henchman. The meeting was surveilled by agents and consensually by Randall. Henchman arrived at the agreed-upon location in a car with a known member of the Henchman organization. Upon their arrival at the meeting spot, Randall entered Henchman's vehicle. The associate exited the car, retrieved a package from the trunk of the car, and got back inside the car. The associate handed the package to Randall. The package was found to contain one kilogram of a white powdery substance that field tested positive for the presence of cocaine. The cocaine was packaged in a food saver bag, similar to packaging used in other seizures made. Henchman earned substantial proceeds as a result of his leadership of the organization. To begin with, both Money and Randall have stated that they have handed to henchmen hundreds of thousands of dollars in cash, sometimes in increments that exceeded $100,000 at a time, that represented the proceeds of narcotic sales. These accounts have been corroborated by various records, interviews and documents that detail henchmen's obsession of large amounts of unexplained cash. 
One of the main waya in which henchmen was able to spend the narcotics proceeds he earned was by converting cash into postal money orders that he used to pay his bills and meet personal expenses. Henchmen structured his purchases of these money orders to avoid generating a report identifying him as the purchaser. For example, henchmen used these money orders to pay his rent, his attorneys and his son's private school tuition, among many other things. Transported to the Eastern District of New York, henchmen ordered money to obtain a local defense attorney to represent Quincy. At their initial meeting, money provided the defense attorney with a piece of paper containing questions that henchmen wanted the defense attorney to ask Quincy. Referring to henchmen as, J, the first two questions stated. When the feds came to see you, did they only ask about J? Who else specifically and what did they claim to know about J and others? The paper also contained a message that henchmen wished a defense attorney to pass along to Quincy which exhorted money not to cooperate. Lastly, stay firm, cause the quantity is small. They gonna try to trick you to talk but don't. Also, K is not talking. So don't give them more than they already have. Several weeks later, henchmen told money that he possessed information that Quincy had attended a proffer meeting with the government and ordered money to visit the defense attorney at his office. Henchmen wanted money to let the defense attorney know that both henchmen and money knew about Quincy's cooperation and that they were displeased that the defense attorney had not kept them abreast of the developments in Quincy's case. Moreover, henchmen ordered money to try to convince the defense attorney to withdraw from representing Quincy. Money promptly visited the defense attorney and relayed those messages to him. Following this encounter, the defense attorney feared for his safety and that of Quincy. Several days later, during a consensually recorded telephone conversation, the defense attorney told Money that he would no longer represent him, to which Money responded approvingly, my man. Additionally, after the arrest of another member of the henchman organization in 2010, Rose Mom learned that the member had attended a proffer meeting with the government. Following this revelation, henchmen told Money numerous times that he was contemplating murdering this member. However, Money told henchmen that, in light of this investigation, it would be unwise to commit an offense that could result in capital punishment. This reasoning helped persuade henchmen to drop the plan. Agents also have spoken to numerous attorneys and witnesses who revealed that henchmen paid or offered to pay the attorney costs for at least five witnesses involved in this investigation. Further, Henchman has paid for a private investigator to visit several witnesses, including incarcerated witnesses, to determine if the witnesses were cooperating with the government. Based on my experience, training and knowledge of this investigation, I believe that Henchman's numerous attempts to prevent co-conspirators from revealing information to the government demonstrates Henchman's consciousness of guilt and his well-founded fear that the individuals he tampered with possessed information damaging to Henchman and the Henchman organization. In June 2010, he was arrested on charges of cocaine trafficking, money laundering, and witness tampering. Henchman went on trial in May 2012, represented by Gerald Shargill. On June 5, 2012, Henchman was convicted in federal district court in Brooklyn of drug trafficking, obstruction of justice, firearms violations and other financial crimes associated with his position as head of a multi-million dollar transnational cocaine selling organization. He was also charged with four crimes in connection with the death of G-Unit affiliate Lowell Lodi Mac Lodi Mac, including murder for hire and conspiracy to commit murder. On October 25, 2013, Henchman was sentenced to life imprisonment. As part of his sentence, Henchman forfeited approximately $14 million in cash and property. United States Attorney for the Eastern District of New York, Loretta E. Lynch, said that Henchman's carefully crafted image as a music mogul was in reality, a cover for the real Jimmy Henchman, a thug in a suit. Presiding Judge John Gleason remarked that he would have sentenced Henchman to life, even if it were not legally required, as his crimes were astonishing in their breadth, duration and intensity. But there is not much else to detail in this story. This was the story of Jimmy Henchman.